Let's look at the gospel lesson from this morning. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Who was it who said that, do you think? Jesus, good answer. It's always a good answer, isn't it? If the pastor says, who is it? You say Jesus, and you're probably 50% of the time going to be right with that one. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. I'll ask the Father, and he'll give you another advocate to be with you forever. Seems strange, doesn't it? It's the season of Easter still for two more Sunday or one more Sunday. Next Sunday is the Sunday of the Ascension, and we enter into Pentecost. But the time when we focus on the resurrection of Christ, we have this lesson that comes to us from the night before he died. Disciples have gathered together in John's Gospel, not necessarily the Passover meal, but close enough to it that they would be thinking about the celebration that was theirs. They were thinking that God was about to restore Israel to its place of prominence, kick out Rome, reestablish the kingdom here on earth, and it was all going to be wonderful. And Jesus tells them not so much like that. But he does say, I'll ask the Father, he'll give you another advocate to be with you forever. Advocate is a word that's still used today. What is an advocate? Somebody tell me. That's not a rhetorical question. What's an advocate do? Someone who speaks on another person's behalf or acts on another person's behalf. If you ever get taken to court, you need an advocate, right? Have you ever met a patient advocate in the hospital who comes and says, how's everything going, how are you being treated, things like that? Advocate literally means the one who comes alongside you. And I always think, when I think, especially on Mother's Day or Father's Day of an advocate, I think of the one who runs along beside a bicycle holding it up. Anybody learn how to ride that way? Anybody the one who ran alongside the bicycle that way? And you're always afraid to let go, right? Because once you let go, what's going to happen? They're either going to step or they're going to fall over and you just pray. And you run behind them and try to keep them upright. I had an advocate who came alongside me, not for riding a bicycle, but for learning to can. When I lived in West Virginia, I moved there. Somebody said to me, do you put up anything this year? And I said, put up anything? I didn't know what that meant. I was from Maryland in those days. Now I'm from West Virginia, kind of, John, right? I'm sort of a half-naturalized West Virginian now. But people said, you put up with anything? did you put anything up this year? I said, I put up with you. I said, put my hair up a couple of times. I said, no, did you put up anything? I said, I have no idea what that means. He said, you can anything. I said, oh, no. But I took up canning. It was great. One of my members came over with a bushel of green beans, and the two of us worked all day and canned this bushel of green beans. I said, this is so much fun. And she's like, whatever. But without her, I wouldn't have known what to do, especially when those cans started going ping, ping, ping. I said, they're going to explode. And she said, nope, they're not going to explode. We hope. Like, what do you mean we hope? But if they don't ping, they're not sealed. Well, I loved canning so much that day when I bought my own bushel of green beans and canned on my own, and it was not as much fun. But I would never have known what to do without her. So, whether you're canning green beans or canning berries, which is much more fun than canning green beans, to make jelly is more fun. Amen, Gail, than canning green beans? Yeah. I don't have to do that ping, ping, ping pressure canning thing with jelly. But um, whatever you do, it's easier to have someone come alongside you. And Jesus is saying to them, I'm going to send you another advocate to be with you forever. Before he is raised up, he says to them, you know, I'll be with you always, even to the end of the age in Matthew's Gospel, the great commission that we hear there. But another advocate, I'm going to Somebody else is going to come alongside you. This is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you and he will be in you. The part of God that lives within each of us, the part of God that's in each person here, the part of God that I see very clearly in all of you is the spirit, not an incarnation like Jesus. He's not going to take physical form, or she as the case may be, because the Greek always assigns a gender to a word. And the neutral, it's neutral in, in Greek, but in Hebrew it's ruach, which is a feminine word. So some people will say the Holy Spirit is not an it, it's a she or a he, but it is a person of God, part of who God is. And we know that to be created in God's image does not mean to be male or female or a certain color or a certain ethnicity. It doesn't mean to have certain physical properties. It means to have a heart that understands God's love, that understands who Christ is, that relates to the world through its heart. But then Jesus goes on to say, I'm not going to leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live. You also will live. 
words that I say every time I conduct a funeral, because I live, you also will live. Reminder that we all need at the time when we're grieving someone's loss, that Christ who was, who is, is coming back, and to claim us all and take us all to heaven with him. If we live in him, we're going to die with him, we're going to be raised with him. I will not leave you orphaned. One of my congregations had three sets of identical twins, 10 months old, middle schoolers, and then two ladies who were in their 70s. Now, the ones who were 10 months old, I couldn't tell them apart until they were 10 years old, and they could tell me their names. The middle schoolers always tried to trick me, and I figured them out. But the 70-year-old, one was always smiling, one was never smiling, so they were sort of easy to tell apart. My husband, I ran into him in the grocery store once, and he said, well, I've never seen Sandy so happy before and laughing and joking around. What was wrong with her? I said, it was Carol. It was Sandy. But I was with them the day their mother died. I was in the room when their mother took her last breath and she died and they looked at each other and they burst out sobbing and they both said exactly at the same time, we're orphans now. That was the first time that happened and it wasn't the last time. People, no matter when they lose their second parent, have this sense of being alone in the world, being abandoned, being just left alone. I went to seminary with a woman whose parents were killed in an accident when she was a child and she had no siblings. And she hated whenever anyone sang the song, sometimes I feel like a motherless child because she said no one knows what that feels like unless they are a motherless child. Very painful experience. But Jesus understands our pain because he is God become human to take on our flaws, take on our sins, but also take on our emotions. He knows what it is to be left alone, to be abandoned, which is why he's hanging on the cross saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That psalm that he does not finish on the cross goes on to say, I will praise you in the midst of your people. At that moment, he's feeling very lost and alone. He can understand our lost and alone feelings as well. But he is there to say to them on the night before he dies that in a little while the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will know that I am my father and you and me and I and you. They also will have my commandments and keep them are those who love me, and those who love me will be loved by my Father and will love them and reveal myself to them. Now, it was a strange morning because I got to the first service and realized we had the wrong epistle lesson. Whoopsie, whoopsie. Which was the title of my sermon, you know, Gentleness and Reverence, because it's Mother's Day. Whether you're a mother or whether you had a mother, you all had a mother, right? No one came into this world any other way but through their mom. Yes, some of you look like you're not sure. You're looking like, is that how I came here? Yes, you all had a mom. You all know what it is to love a mother, right? And to have a mother's love. I hope most of you know that. Some people have very difficult childhood experiences. But if you didn't have the love from your mother, I hope you found someone who mothered you. I've gotten Mother's Day cards through the years. The first one I got was from a woman who was in her 80s who said, thank you for being my mom. And I was in my 20s, and I said to her, how can I be like your mom? And she said, you're the mother of the congregation. Went on to tell me her mother died when she was very young. And so she was glad. She said, I never thought I'd have a female pastor, and I'm glad to have someone who's like a mom to me. I got a re-Mother's Day card once. I got a card that somebody had written in a big red R-E. I said, what is re-Mother's Day? And he said, my mother was really a mess, but you have re-mothered me, and I wanted to thank you for that. Never got to have kids of my own. I got my Ivan in my office, but I never got to have children of my own, so I always wanted desperately. But I had a very good example of motherhood of my own mom and my, my father's mother who lived next door. Which is why I want to look at the passage that we have from Peter today. Talking about suffering, we all have to suffer, but suffering and hope sometimes go hand in hand, don't they? And already... Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you accounting for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and reverence. Why do we hope in the midst of these crazy days? Kelsey Bardolph was here at the first service, and I said, how are kids doing in school right now? She said, not well. She's a guidance counselor on the high school level, and she said, kids are not doing well at all since the pandemic. They're struggling. I said, what are they struggling against? She said, just about everything in life. We got a lot of teachers in this congregation. I pray for every teacher and every student by name every day. Make sure you're safe and that's, that we're holding you in heart. And I know a lot of you have joined me in that. I do it in alphabetical order to challenge myself every day. It begins with Abby, 
Gandavali and I'm with Theo, who is here this morning with his dad out in the other room right now. Yes, she's in the bathroom. That's good. It's a very good thing at that age, isn't it? I'm sure your mother's at home going, great, great, great thing to say. But we need to be prepared to tell people why we hope in the midst of a world that's filled with brokenness. Why do you hope in Christ? Let me ask you, again, not a rhetorical question. Why is, why is your hope in Jesus Christ in the midst of the craziness of this world? Why is your hope in Jesus Christ? For essential peace, did you say? For a sense of peace, was it? For a sense of peace. If you know Christ, you know peace. If you know Christ, you know love. What else? Why do you hope in Christ? He's already overcome. Amen. Looking at that. He's already overcome, reminding ourselves that that's how we get every Sunday to celebrate the resurrection. No matter how scary life is, Christ rose from the dead. And what does he say? He's going to wait for us. He will be there when we get there, right? He's going to come again and take us to himself. Anybody else? Why do you hope in Christ? You got to be ready to say that to somebody because people will ask you, why, why do you bother with this crazy 2,000-year-old religious nonsense? in this wonderful scientific age we live in. you got to be ready to tell people why you hope. Why do you hope in Christ? Anybody? Yes. Because your mom made you. Good for your mom. She got you behind the church, didn't she, all the time. Amen. Is your mom here this morning? Here she is. I can't see when you sit behind those tall grandsons of yours. It's hard to see you back there, Kathy. What else? Why do you hope in Christ? There is always hope. We're connected to Christ. Everyone who bears Christ's name across this planet who's worshiping this morning or later today or this evening with us shares Christ. He lives in us. His spirit abides in us. To abide is to connect and to stay and remain with us. If Christ is in us, then Christ has to get out of us. We've got to share Christ in the world. We've got to do it with gentleness and reverence. I love the Alpha Course. Anybody here ever take the Alpha Course? It's an introduction to Christianity came out of the Church of England, which is not known for its warm, fuzzy self, but they really do. They talk about speaking in tongues and everything else, which is just so not Anglican in some ways. But it's a program that invites people to come into the congregation wherever they're coming from and share Christ with one another in whatever way they know. And you say to someone, what is it that you believe? And someone will say, well, I believe in reincarnation. Instead of saying, no, 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 and fixing that. And you say, tell me more about that. Tell me more. With gentleness and reverence, you explore where they are and you help them to get where they should be in Christ, where they need to be in Jesus Christ. I had people come to be baptized as adults coming to Christ through the Alpha Course because they said it was the first time anybody ever asked them a question without telling them how wrong they are. Because the church can be really hard on folks, can't we sometimes? We're really hard on each other. With gentleness and reverence. It used to be the great trifecta of Church attendance was first Christmas, second Easter, then Mother's Day. Because mothers would, their kids would say, what would you want for Mother's Day? And they'd say, I want you to go to church with me. And then after this, oh, they'd come. Not so much anymore. But we've got to reclaim that with gentleness and reverence, we can lead others to the truth of God and Jesus Christ. As long as we are ready to say, I hope in Christ because of this. I've told this story before. I'm going to have lunch with my friend or breakfast soon because I just lost another two friends from college and a professor from college and we're going to get together my friend Damon and I. Damon grew up in a Catholic family and his father died very suddenly when he was a teenager or just about a teenager and the church sort of abandoned his mom and she lost their home because of 
their income dropping. And he sort of turned against the church at that point. And he said to me, what are you going to do if you wake up dead and realize there's no God? I said, honey, if there's no God, I ain't waking up when I'm dead. Let's be honest. He said, good point. But I would have had a life based on hope. And I know that there is a God. I know that Jesus Christ came to save me. That's why I thank him every morning. Thank you for my baptism and place in your church. Thank you for sending Jesus Christ to be the Savior of the world and my Savior, because I need a Savior. I don't know about you. I need a Savior. I need to know that the Spirit abides in me and works through me, even on my worst days. And I'm facing some bad days. Mother's Day is hard this year. There are several reasons. This is my mother's last Mother's Day. It's obvious she's going to be gone in the next short time. That's hard for me to say, Happy Mother's Day this year. It's not a very happy day in my life. But it's hard because, too, I think, you know, I will not leave you orphaned, and we're scared of that orphan word. But I think about that little boy who was, whose parents and brother were killed. He was pulled out from under his parent this week in the shooting. They couldn't even tell if it was a boy or a girl because he was covered with so much blood. Who's going to raise him? Who's going to tell him the good news of Jesus Christ? Let's hope to God he has a community to surround him and uphold him in the most difficult time of his little life. It worries me. We're going to do an active shooter regrouping here at the church for our preschool. Nothing we should ever have to do. We have to do things like that because the world we live in is a scary place which is why we need to say that our hope is in Jesus Christ, who lives in and through us, who will reach beyond our brokenness and bring us wholeness and peace and love and joy and all the things we're promised. Because he lives, we shall live also. That is the promise that is ours in Christ. That's my reason to hope. I don't know what is. I look around and I see all the people we've lost in the congregation, the ladies who lost their husbands in the last year, John who lost his wife just in a short period of time. We need to reclaim the hope that is ours in Jesus Christ. We need to let it fill us and overflow from us and expand into the community so that we're there for little kids who lose their parents in this world. We're there for people who are 70 years old who feel orphaned. We're there for each other. so We can teach each other how to can if we need to or how to be in this world if we need to. Because suffering does happen in this life, doesn't it? But the joy that is ours in Christ is incomparable and steadfast and sure. So for those of you who are moms who did it right, God bless you. For those who are moms or who had mothers who didn't quite get it right, may God redeem your loss and your heartache. For those of you like me who never got to have kids of your own, may God bless you with hundreds of others in your path who need a mother or a re-mother that you might exercise with them all the love that's in your heart. May God give us all this. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, amen, amen, and amen.